and so we needed to lighten up. But before we did that, we we uh, we, we we started heavy-handed. I see some things coming through the chat room, but I'm not able to see it. So forgive me if someone's monitoring that. That would be useful. Um, capability and team health awareness. So every time I thought about having a team measure themselves, we kept thinking, well, let's give them a checklist, right? And they can just fill in the checklist and tell us how they're doing. And we, we always got scared that these checklists were going to be misinterpreted as Big Brother watching you and that it was going to be turned into a, you know, pivoted and spreadsheeted and it was just going to be evil. So I turned it into something called a capability and team health awareness spreadsheet, right? It was a little softer and teams were supposed to do this through retrospectives. And you're going to see a little bit of this as I go on. And then some portfolio um, reports derived directly out of our uh, development tracking system, like how many story points are we doing and, and how many bugs are, are, are getting resolved and, and what teams are working on them, et cetera. But not too much, just come reports, no, no real metrics. And then of course, to get started, um, even doing a retrospective, you know, how do you teach teams to do them? You, you kind of give them a little bit of a prescription, you might say, you give them a pattern to follow. Um, that says, well, you just came out of your demo. Wouldn't it be nice to capture the demo notes, at least know what your feedback points are, and maybe take some action based on those, that feedback. Um, talk about what you did well, what you can improve, uh, things you want to start doing, things you want to stop doing. You know, the recognition that's, that doing good things is, is not to be taken for granted, and you've got to keep focused on doing those good things and then this was, you know, the famous one, things that are puzzling the team. And, and even that question is puzzling, you know, well, what do you mean puzzling me? Yeah, I don't know, even know why I'm doing Agile. Thanks. Thanks for asking. Uh, so the retrospectives were really painful at the beginning of time. Uh, teams didn't know how to conduct them. Uh, they wanted to be very strict. Oh, no one else is supposed to be at the retrospective, not even a coach. So goodbye. Goodbye, Dave. You can't come to the retrospective. And so we ended up not knowing how those retrospectives were really going because we couldn't coach them through it. So I would have separate coaching sessions for that. And again, all of this is around health and metrics. We're trying to get to that point. All right, so this is what I came up with and it wasn't done in a vacuum. It was sort of done with, with Mark's help, uh, Mark Aligns that is. And we came up with a spreadsheet, which, you know, look, I, I, I'm not totally in love with with having these spreadsheets. But, but if you look carefully at some of these questions, team delivers 100% of the work committed to from the iteration planning session. So we're basically saying, if you're a scrum team, you should be asking yourself this question. It's almost like asking your kid, um, did you brush your teeth? And what are you trying to get across when you ask that? You're, you're trying to get across that they're, that it's good to brush your teeth. And so um, asking questions, for, uh, to, to kind of train the teams of all the goodness of doing this stuff was what it was about. And so we wouldn't track them, but we'd ask them to rate themselves. So they'd put a date in, iteration number, it's construction one, and they'd rate themselves from one to 10 on all these, on all these topics. Uh, for instance, as part of the team dependability, stakeholders pleased with iteration demonstrations. Well, what was the feedback? Was it good? Was it shitty? I mean, where? Where does it land? And did you maintain a velocity that you were happy with or were you improving in some way? So all of these were sort of very subjective numbers, but they were numbers nevertheless, one to 10. And so each category, team dependability, adherence to scrum practices, adherence to lean. So if you were a Kanban team, you know, they, they weren't even that smart with life cycles yet. We were kind of asking them, well, what kind of work do you have? Do you have like support work? Okay, maybe you should try Kanban first, lean. Uh, or if you're a if you're a project team, maybe you should try Scrum first because you're, you know, you have these quantums of work that you're trying to predict, and and maybe the push is better than the pull. And then this whole notion of whole team, each member does a test not related to their specialty. So um, how do you train a team to be cross-functional? You advise them to give work away. Uh, whenever they're about to pick work, you give work away, and someone else picks that work that not, is not very good at it. And and that's a great way to start because it's a conscious decision to learn something new and someone else is going to mentor you. And yes, it slows you down, but then you learn how to estimate based on that and you start to kind of get better at it. So these are all sort of the questions that we asked 
And you'll notice governance, architecture is proven early, supports, NFRs, you know, were you thinking about these things? And again, we weren't very mature, so we asked very naive questions, but they're pretty good. Like, look at the quality ones. Complex issues were coded by pairs of developers. Oh, I didn't know I should be doing that. I thought I was supposed to be alone focusing on stuff. No, no, you should be talking with your team about this stuff and getting others involved. Um, and then, you know, this whole idea of full regression, partial regression, this was very open link isms. We had sort of crippled um, continuous integration. It wasn't real. It was sort of overnight testing. And in some cases, we'd wait a month to do regression tests. So the question is how much of that was really being preserved and respected um, and so on. So if you, if you, you know, if I take a step back, each of these categories ended up producing on subsequent tabs in the spreadsheet, a spider graph, a very non-threatening way for a team to look at it and say, well, it was supposed to be on the outside and we're kind of not on the outside on everything. So where do we need to improve? Oh, Iteration review preparation takes maximum two hours. Holy crap, that's a long time. I don't want to prepare for a review at all. I would rather just take what I've produced and start to demo it immediately, no preparation at all. But we had some practices in place. We had, you know, sort of an agreement that we wanted a common outcome to all the reviews. So we had this nice slide deck that was a nice pattern that we all followed and we filled in all the slides. And it was something to get started with. And so it took product owners an hour or two to, to get this prepped every iteration, which is way too much. But I'm a product owner now. I spend at least a half an hour putting a, a demo together or, or a review deck together because it's got some interesting things inside of it that I want to I wanna keep doing. And so what do you look at? You look at the last four iterations, potentially, and, and, and you see where you're going. So yeah, whole team. And, and so you gave, you gave the team a tool to figure out for themselves how to measure themselves. Are they getting better? And nobody looked at this except the team. We took it and threw it away. And the teams actually didn't believe us that we weren't looking at this from the leadership side, but we really didn't care. We just wanted them to be self-aware. And the only way to be self-aware is to ask yourself a question, measure yourself, weigh yourself. You wanna lose weight, weigh yourself every morning, right? Otherwise you're not gonna know. Okay, so why metrics in the first place? Um, this is, what we believed it was the goal ultimately of making informed decisions throughout the organization not just throughout the organization but within the teams um, agile always encourages this honest transparent sort of feeling that you, you know you ain't got no secrets and and you want to make sure that everybody is, is is made aware of what's actually going on so this transparency is really important but also we know that with, with this great power comes great responsibility. You can't just give teams the rope and say, have at it, do anything you think is appropriate. No, that doesn't work, right? You need good governance. And so some of this dependability and responsibility comes into play. You, you, you have to be responsible in the way that you execute on your plan so that people are okay with it, they understand it, and they maybe they even disagree with it. But if they don't know it, then they don't have a way to, to, to chime in. And this was for ourselves and for our stakeholders and sponsors and customers. Why not just be honest and transparent? So if things are going really well, say it. If things are not going so well, why don't you say it, right? And it takes a lot of courage to come forward to a customer and say, we're not on track and here's why. Uh, again, metrics are touchy. They're a touchy subject. We have a love-hate relationship with metrics in the past. At OpenLink, we didn't have any tracking information. We couldn't tell if a project was on track, off track. I mean, developers were hiding under their desk. We couldn't tell what they were doing. Um, and it really was right out of a Dilbert episode where you could literally hide away and no one would know the status of a project. Um, the, the, the stats on a project were inappropriate. Things were measured the wrong way. Um, I, we were measure, pr measuring productivity by how many hours you worked. So if you worked, you know, 12 hour days, wow, you were working hard. It didn't matter what you actually produced. And that was kind of kooky. So as time grew, we started having uh, charts that were, met, were showing the measurements of real things. And it wasn't metrics so much, but it was more like statistics. These are the facts that are coming out of 
uh, the, the, the reality of Jiro, the reality of a spreadsheet. Um, delivery and dependability metrics emerge through burndowns and release plans. And since uh, you know, burndowns were made available to me in, in my career, I've learned to hate them very much. Um, burndowns for me are, are useful until they run out of uh, height and then they're not useful anymore. And so for me, burnups are way more valuable, although I don't show you one here. But just imagine that the burnup shows um, you know, the scope growing over time in reality and sometimes even going down. And then the team is like, ah, oh, climbing a mountain to reach it. And so you can see what's going on and you can actually move the axis over time as to what part of the burnup you are focusing on. And for me, it's a, it's a lot more relevant. Um, and I have some really good examples of burnups. I'm, I'm just sorry I didn't throw it in here. What you're looking at next on the right, uh, I'm sorry, in the middle, is a Gantt chart, which again is a burn down, but it's, it's, it's useful because if I zoom in a bit, you'll see that this is a phased project. So we were kind of, uh, we couldn't get out of this phased approach that we were in, but we were adopting. So, okay, we allowed it. And what we're basically saying here is, yeah, phase one is a transition we didn't write transition, but we put all the, all the milestones, all the discipline agile milestones. We've got the stakeholder vision, and we've got, look, we've got two proven architectures. That's nice. We've got one that proves something complex needs to be built. This was a real-time pivot uh, with real-time data um, that was distributed across multiple servers. This was enormous, this pivot, and it took sub-seconds to complete because it was properly designed uh, but we had to prove the architecture. We had to make sure this thing would actually wiggle and work. And then slightly after that, maybe a month later, two iterations, we're proving all the non-functional requirements, all the performance. And so we had to get it to wiggle first, and then we proved its performance, and then we knew we couldn't fail. All we had to do was um, sort of get all the features filled out. And, and here's a nice arrow that says, oh, we are here. So every iteration, I would sort of move this forward an iteration, and I would show where we are. And this code cutoff, this scope cutoff, was really about stop building and start productionizing. And in our case, we weren't, we didn't have a good CI CD pipeline. So we actually had a fairly long transition phase for the first deliverable. We had, um, actually look, we had UAT. So we had a customer UATing the solution before it became production, but while we were working on phase two. So, this was a really good compromise at the beginning. We, we couldn't get out of this phase one, phase two sort of paradigm. And so measuring our success was done in two clicks, you might say. One was get it to the customer, get some feedback, but look how, look how many months we had to wait. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven months to get it to the customer because we didn't have a good pipeline. And then we finally got some feedback and then we continued working on all the not so important stuff, the stuff that they could have waited or maybe never received. And we did have a real sufficient functionality milestone and we really did make this production ready and we really did have delighted stakeholder. And that, that is when it officially left the building. So this whole notion of measuring yourself, you can't discount the fact that you've got all these real obstacles in the way. These, these, this Gantt is really like a, a chart of hurdles to get over. Um, and so the, the measurement of this, and if you look at this, this is the velocity chart, and it goes to the metrics directly. You know, I look how invalid this stuff really is. It didn't really tell the, the whole story. So the way you read this is the, the horizontal blue line is what the prediction was for the team. And the blue bar is the number of story points they actually achieved. So sometimes it was under the bar, Sometimes it was over the bar and all the excuses for why, like if you didn't reach it this time, maybe you reached it next time and more, right? So you're able to, to, to sort of get some gain out of it. Um, the green line was the original plan from inception. I plan to do 12 story points every iteration. And looking back, it was sort of naive to kind of leave that there because that was just a projection at the beginning of time. I, I would rather have measured it and just thrown the green line away after my original prediction. 
which if you just ignore the green line, you've got these two other lines. The, the red one is a four iteration moving average that shows, well, you're trending in the right direction. It's coming down. Well, no, I want it to go up. Oh, okay. Um, I'm stabilizing, right? So I did a lot. And then all of a sudden I really stabilize. Maybe this is my prediction. So I should have made other predictions instead of the, the one that was down here, the 12. And then the purple one is the actual moving average, right? The instantaneous average. So that one's not good to look at at all because that, that doesn't really take into consideration what you've done for me lately. The, the four point moving average is like reality. I'm learning, I'm getting better. And four points is two months worth of work. And you know maybe that makes a lot more sense to make predictions. Um, and if you're a DA nut like I am, if you if you open up, crack open the book, and you look at the range prediction, um, uh, the curve over the range prediction, the probability curve, um, I actually experimented with live data trying to do Monte Carlo simulations to predict that probability curve to see where people finish. And so burn up is the only way to do that. So it's something that worth looking at if you have an interest, take a look at the book and look at the range predictions. Okay, um, yeah, why agile metrics again? What's the other goal? Continuous improvement. So yeah, I wanna know where I've been so I can, in the rear view mirror, kind of go, I've been there. Now let me see if I can make some, some predictions and maybe even improve. So the things that kept coming up were not the things you would expect about continuous improvement. Circumstances that work against us. I think of it as the wind blowing in my face. You know, I'm kind of pushing back. I'm trying to improve, but oh my goodness, um, potentially making us less efficient. All these things that work against me in my company that, that potentially make me less efficient. How am I going to improve if I'm fighting that, that draft that is blowing in my face? Lots of things distracting me from, from making good on my commitment. So I make a commitment and then my company pokes me with a stick. Every time I say, I promise I will get this done, don't distract me. And they go, okay, we won't distract you, keep working. And then they come over every five minutes and they poke me with a stick, right? They give me escalated items and defects. And, and can you, can you uh, the, the help this person? And can you answer this customer? And, and, and basically, it's like a challenge. They, they want you to be dependable, but they also want to distract the hell out of you. And so you've got to get a backbone as an agile team to be able to push back and say, listen, okay, something's got to give. If you want me to be, be dependable and you want me to make good predictions and you want me to improve, you have to protect me. You have to help me to do that. Um, so that was part of the calculus for, for me. Um, and of course, I'm not just looking to improve my metrics, I'm looking to improve the human process because that's what it is. It's the human process you're looking to, to get better at. Uh, teams look to improve their process of delivering results. So we want to surface problems and then we want to take care of those problems, have the courage to face those problems quickly. And sometimes they're very difficult problems, technically challenging, um, personally challenging. And by the way, there's this pressure, you're in a pressure cooker to finish by a deadline, really difficult. And you wanna do this in a non-prescriptive manner. And you wanna be empowered with choices so that you can have that try mentality. I'm gonna try something, do me a favor, just turn around while I'm trying. And if it doesn't work, I can just you know safely get away with trying something else. I may waste some time doing this, but I hope it doesn't count against me in my final you know, report card. So the metrics reflect all of that stuff. And you almost want to close your eyes to it because it's not something you want to measure. You want to allow it. Um, DA provides this guidance, right, to help you improve. It encourages the governance because um, nothing worse than not being governed, right? Uh, I often tell the story in class about um, I want governance, right? I want people to check up on me. I want people to guide me and to measure me in some way. I, I talk about when I taught my kids how to swim, I would say to them, you're not allowed in the pool without a lifeguard. And by the way, if you're in the pool without a lifeguard, you should get out of the pool and come find your lifeguard and yell at them that they're not governing you properly. Um, you deserve to be governed well, you deserve to be safely governed. Um, and that is a very important point of DA. 
that if you don't have the governance there, then you're not going to guide yourself into the right decisions. That self-awareness doesn't become so important anymore because nobody's watching you. Uh, and, and also this, this notion of measuring your progress, very important. Uh, we also encourage the resi to resist anti-patterns. Well, in what type of an organization can you just say, sorry, boss, check with the product owner before you interrupt me without being fired? I mean, it's really important to recognize that there are people in positions that are being courageous for the first time in their career, and they're saying, no, we have a process for this, not because we want to be a lawyer with you, but because it works. And we need some tempering. You can't just ask us to do anything, anytime, for any reason. It has to have value, and it has to not interrupt our normal flow, otherwise we won't get anything done. So this whole idea of not under or over committing, um, I tell teams all the time, don't expect to be dependable right away. You're going to be very not dependable for a long time. But here's my, here's, here's what I ask you. If you undercommit, please try to correct that. And if you overcommit, you have to correct that. There's nothing worse than overcommitting. I would rather you commit to one thing, even though you can do 50 and, and, and I guarantee that I get that one thing because I can hang my hat on it. I can, I can bet the ranch on that. I'm going to get that delivered. Really very important. Um, things to look for. So teams are taught to look for steep burndowns instead of gradual burndowns. Steep burndowns means badness is happening. I want a gradual burndown. I want to steadily make progress with uh, like a stepladder approach in my burndown when I look at JIRA. If I have these big cliffs, these large cliffs, it means I'm waiting till the last minute to do something and then I'm racing to get it done. And I run the risk of not doing that cliff item, in which case I will fail the iteration. Where if I get a lot of little things done, what do I leave behind? I leave behind little things, not these big things. Uh, product owners uh, add or change the scope midway through the iteration. Most say, in Scrum at least, that that's not allowed. That fails the iteration. In DA, we're lenient because it makes sense and it's reality. Talk to the team. Negotiate with the product owner. Is this really valuable? If so, what will it take to get it done also? Can the team handle it? And of course, without impacting their current um, commitments. Uh, what if there's no progress made over a period of several iterations? Something very wrong. This is an anti-pattern. People making excuses. No, I was interrupted. No, I was interrupted. No, I was interrupted. Oh, no, no, it has nothing to do with you being interrupted. That story's too big. You should be splitting that down into small quantifiable um, activities that make it possible for you to succeed even with the interruptions. So if you haven't done anything about it in a bunch of iterations, that's an anti-pattern. You, you see the problem and you're not doing anything about it. And then of course, this is the most obvious one and this is the result of a product owner that doesn't know how to say no. Uh, scope grows faster than the team can absorb it. Uh, first rule of a great product owner is they learn how to say no the things that are not valuable or not ranked first, and they say yes later when they're when somebody takes them out to dinner and talks them into it. You know, uh, that's almost the joke that you have to buy. You have to buy my love when you've overcommitted me. So measuring improvement. Um, how do we know we are getting better as an organization while we continue the transformation journey? We need to measure ourselves, but we can't just measure anything. Um, I often heard from CEOs saying, do me a favor, just collect all the metrics you have, all the data you have, just, just give it all to me and I'll figure out what's going on. And my answer is, I, I don't think you understand what you're asking. That is a huge waste of time. Why don't you just ask me what you want to know and I'll figure out what metric, what I should measure. What are you looking for? Um, well, I want to know if it's working. Well, what do, you, what do you mean it's working? I want to know if Agile is working. Well, I, I don't know if I can measure if it's working or not working. I can measure certain outcomes. I can measure um, certain things, but not others. Well, let's talk about the things you want to measure, CEO. I want to know that I'm building the right product. Maybe there's a way I can measure that. Oh, maybe. Let's, let's think about this. Um, am I producing quality results? Uh, that's a good question. We need to measure this somehow. And is the team being productive? Well, that's a rough one. I don't really know the definition of product, productive team. 
but let's look at some of the qualities of a productive team. Is there waste within the team or within the project? How do I measure that? I can certainly measure on the unplanned activities and I can look at measuring my technical debt. And this is where the fun began. And I, I decided I'm gonna attack this. I'm gonna tackle this somehow. So here's what I came up with. I took the iteration. So this box is one iteration, this whole box, right? So from here to here. And I broke it into exactly the things that I was looking to measure and then figured, I, there's got to be a way to measure this somehow. Let, let, let's figure this out. So I looked at the technical debt, reduced technical debt, legacy defects. Those are defects that have nothing to do with escaping the iteration. They predated Agile. They, they, we, we, got, we inherited a laundry list of defects. And if I get rid of them, then I increase the quality. That's fantastic. Okay, so there's, there's an advantage to, to working on legacy defects. I didn't want to get rid of that, but I want to measure its size because look how much time it takes in an iteration. It's a big chunk. Maybe 20% of every iteration is spent, you know, fudging around with, with legacy defects, which I really wish I could get off the plate. Um, what about the bugs I own? I'm really smart and I keep developing code, but I also develop bugs at the same time. And the reason I, I don't find them is they're escaping my iteration without detection. And that could point to a lot of problems. That could point to bad testing. That could point to, uh, misunderstood requirements, uh, and anything really, but gee, if I had a better definition of done and I, and I held true to that, maybe I could get better at that. So, all right, I put, I left that on the table. And then this whole idea of ideal hours that anything that's planned, if I do that during iteration planning, then I'll call it planned. But first, before I'm allowed to plan my iteration, I have to subtract off all the shit that I don't want, all the, all the waste. And so first I deduct my legacy defects from my amount of time I'm allowed to work on planned stuff. And I eliminate, I, and, I, and I allocate some time, I, I call it punishment time, where I have to work out the bugs that I just invented in iteration before. And then, um, you know, there's some work items that come into the iteration that we've deemed not ready, even though we didn't have a sense of ready to start. We did know that the story either wasn't fully baked or we didn't understand it and we wasted a lot of time figuring it out. So let's just have this notion of a definition of ready and we don't even know what that is yet, but let's just confess that some of the time is wasted in the iteration figuring that out. And then we've got this other sort of lightweight waste like we have inefficiencies, we have meetings, we have discussions with other teams, we, we take care of things that we shouldn't, like uh, we have a very cumbersome process for checking code into multiple branches that is very time wasting. So we have all this other waste out there that we have to do, it's compulsory nonsense that we have to do. And then we have this other work, this unplanned stuff that keeps coming in, it's the poking me with the stick nonsense that I can't seem to get away from um, I have product owners changing their minds about stuff that are in flight, unplanned. I have managers coming over to the team that have a memory of what they used to do. They just walk over and they just say, here, can you work on this? I know you have commitments. Who cares? I'm the boss. Do it. So this whole autocratic management nonsense. And so this is reality. When anybody tells me this is not reality, I'm, I was living this. Okay, what's the next step? Um, measure myself. And I start to measure myself and I figure out a way to get these blocks to change their sizes. So how do I get my legacy defects down? I talk the company into doing what's called a bug blitz. Well, we don't develop any new work for a month and everybody works on legacy bugs. And of course the escalated ones, the really important ones that come in. Um, but we were able to get the legacy bugs down so that we only had to work one day an iteration instead of two days an iteration. That's a big deal. That's 10%. That's a big deal. Some teams eliminated their bugs completely. They got them down to like five instead of 500. You know, something ridiculous like that. Um, oh, own the bugs. Yeah, I wish you would own the bugs. More integration testing, more automation, zero tolerance. When I say zero, I mean zero. If you have one bug escape the iteration, that's way too many. 
and you're not doing your job, something is wrong, you better fix it, right? So we, we, we took the tolerance down to zero. So that got the two left edges pretty good. Let's go to the right-hand side. Unplanned work. Well, we used to just say yes to every high priority bug that came in. Yes, 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 yes. And so we started saying, well, can this wait a week until we get to planning? So we can triage it and figure out how big it is and whether it's really a bug or not. I'd like to find out whether, um, how many bugs we actually turn away and tell the customer, this is working as designed. Sorry, Charlie, not a bug. Gee, I wish I had somebody that could front run that shit so I wouldn't have to spend time on it inside the team. Oh, so what we did was we formed a team called Level 3 Support and we populated them with developers. And we had them triage every single bug entering into the company. And if they didn't know how to hand, answer the question, then they let it down into the team. And if they did know how to answer the question, they tried to determine whether is they could handle it themselves and fix it or turn it back before it got to the team at all. So the distractions went down. So that amount of unplanned bugs went away. And then the escalations, the things that came in as the fire with the fire hose, we kept challenging going, this is not an escalation. They have a workaround. This is not stopping them from doing business. They call it escalated because they want it, but we don't. So we had a much better definition about what an escalation is. We had agreement from upper level management that we will be turning these away if they're not at this level, criticality or higher. And so again, we stopped the team from being interrupted. Um, oh, waste and inefficiencies. Again, level three support, lower distractions, lower task switching. Um, all of this stuff really reduced a little bit. And guess who we focused all the metrics on? Level three support. We said, you guys are a focus group. You know exactly what's going on. You know where every bug, what domain it's in. You know exactly whether it got turned away. You know exactly how long you worked on it. Let's measure that. Instead of having every team be distracted by it, let's see if you're, if you're being effective or not. Um, oh, and this was about the right time where I can teach all the product owners to really be great product owners. Stop bringing stories into the iterations that are not written properly, that don't have acceptance criteria, that people don't understand, that you don't even understand, they're too big, or, or just, you know, let, let's teach them how to do their job. And as soon as they got better, we didn't have any work items coming in that were not ready. That got reduced to almost zero. I mean, we still struggle with that a bit, but that's sort of natural so, um, fluctuation. All of a sudden, this green area got bigger, where now I can allocate so much more time to doing planned work. Ultimately, we landed in a very good place. We had the legacy defects reduced almost to nothing, where it was very maintainable. Um, eliminating bugs completely, zero tolerance for bugs. Um, reduce the number of work items that are vague, wrong, or not well established. That was the not ready. And the wastes and inefficiencies eliminated almost completely by having communities of practice that discuss things. Um, uh, stop having your meetings. Um, instead, gather around and have, have the conversations actively and proactively and get rid of the meetings. They were uh, allocating half hour meetings for a five minute discussion, and, and 25 minutes was eating shit at the table and drinking, right? And, and that was a lot of fun, but listen, the five minute conversation was what was most important. And if you could just do that in three minutes, that would be great. Um, almost no unplanned work. Anything that came into the iteration that was considered unplanned was then deemed planable. And so we would take some defects that we could plan and we planned them and others that we couldn't and we kept them unplanned. So we had some very small minority of defects that were unplanned that needed um, high level estimates like, I think two days to figure out what's wrong, two days to fix it, two days to test it, see you next week, you know? And, and that, was, that was like our best hope until we knew more. So that's where we landed. Okay, so what about the metrics? How did we get to that point? So from this, we created metrics that match that picture. We went the other way. And we said, well, remember, remember all those nice adoption metrics that we had, this quality, build pride in the team in their quality? Um, 
is the team spending too much time fixing their own defects? That was the question. So this is the GQM method, the goal question metric method of deriving a metric. You don't just derive a metrics for metrics sake, you have to have a question, you have to have a goal. And so this is, goes directly to that picture. If I want quality and I have to measure my own bugs, I better have pride in that and, and that I'm gonna be zero tolerant. Um, and so what do we measure? Percent time fixing defects from previous iterations. How? On the honor system. We get to the retrospective and we go, did we fix any bugs from a prior iteration? And the team honestly says yes or no, and then they figure out the percentage. We spend 3% of our time fixing bugs from another iteration. Okay, cool. Dependability. Build team commitments to their iteration goals. How often does the team meet their iteration commitments? Well, um, some agilists will say, don't measure that at all, just measure the outcomes, right? Well, we wanted to measure something. We want commitment to be important and that stakeholders should have the right to say, wait a minute, you didn't make good on all your commitments, every last one of them, what gives? And the answer is, well, we make good on our commitments, 100% of our commitments, 80% of the time. So eight times, eight iterations out of 10, we, we, we get all of our commitments done. That's pretty freaking dependable. I mean, I, yet, I have yet to see a team sustain that, where they can do that. And when a team comes back and says, we always meet our commitments 100% of the time, every single iteration, I know they're lying. There's something wrong with, with what they're measuring and how they're doing their work. Um, so percent complete done versus not done, it, it's story points. So we'll take, let's say they committed to 30 story points and they only got uh, 20. 20 done, uh, you know, that was, that's two thirds, right? So that would be whatever, 60% of their commitment. Uh, Gage team productivity. Our teams focused on productive work relating to iteration goals. Well, remember that ideal, um, remember this last chart, ideal planning? It's the number of hours of ideal days that you have for planned work. It used to be this big, now it's this big. If I can maximize that by eliminating all the other crap, then I'm doing pretty well. And I'm not looking for a single team to do it. I'm looking for all the team's aggregate numbers so I can see if the whole organization is getting better. So I wouldn't want to measure a single team because every team has different struggles, but I would want to look at the average per team to go up. Okay, so there I am. Productivity is measured in ideal days. Wow. I don't know if I would measure that, but that's the closest I've come to something that's fair, where I'm not actually measuring somebody's hours at work. I'm measuring how many hours they're allowed to plan for productive work. And then the last two I call transformation metrics. And there are only five metrics across the whole organization that are meaningful. Um, reduce technical debt. Oh, we're spending less time fixing legacy defects while keeping the defense counts low. I basically am saying, how small is that time box getting for maintenance? If I can keep that low, I know I have to do it, but if I can keep it really low, then I'm in good shape. I'm not creating a buffer every iteration to go, I don't know how many legacy defects I can fix. Ah, we'll spend three or four days working on that in 10 days. That sucks. That, that, that means I can't do anything real. And then building the right product, I just wanted a metrics to measure a metric to measure how well a product owner is doing. And so I decided I'm going to measure the number of stories not ready. Just an account. And it's on the honor system. All these are, are on the honor system. And it worked really well. Everybody took them seriously. So an example, right? Quality, 10% of the time is, is, is spent fixing legacy, uh, fixing bugs I invented. 80% uh, dependability, that's a great number. 4.5 out of six. So if you, if you measure an ideal day as six hours, if I can get that number close to five, I'm in great shape because there is waste. And by the way, being a great team lead, you will find yourself not being productive some portion of the day and your number starts at like five as a team lead. You can't be productive. And then again, 20%, that's two days out of 10. And here's the reason, the rationale, missing use cases, not enough PO time to resolve. Ah, so they brought a story into the iteration without enough use cases. And then I went and defined these because 
everybody needs a definition, right? What am I measuring? Okay, here's the first one. Goal, build team pride in their quality. We strive for this metrics value to be zero. No defects escape the iteration. Teams note which defects escape the iteration, evaded the definition of done for whatever reason. And look, the metric may indicate more than just defects. It may indicate a team's inability to translate stories or acceptance criteria into working software. This may indicate poor product ownership, as well as any number of development inadequacies, such as poor peer reviews, poor testing, uh, or poor testing procedures, inadequate use cases, et cetera. So don't just blame the developers, right? Immediately blame the developers. No, it could be any number of things. Same thing for dependability. We strive for this metrics to be a hundred metric to be a hundred percent. All commitments delivered each iteration. Very tough to stay true to in the real world. Um, productivity. We strive for this metrics to be very close to six hours. One ideal day. If my ideal day has been shaved away because of other wasteful things, I'm not so productive. And you'll notice there's no attachment to the person. It's not the function of the person. It's a function of their ability to deliver productive work in a day based on the noise. If I could lower the noise, I could raise the productive work. So I really put it on the organization. I blamed them first. They hated this, this metric. It was the only one that made sense to me and they hated it. Because they kept saying, six hours? Our guys don't work six hours, they work 12 hours. No, 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 you don't understand. This is for planning purposes. You know, people have the right to go to the bathroom and to take a walk and maybe to breathe and maybe even to sit back and think and not work. How long does it take to think out a solution? I might pace it around for a day before I even sit down to type one byte. So it was interesting because I invented this capacity worksheet. It's, I call it a vacation planner because it was softer and nicer. But you'll notice every team member is listed here. I'm in there too somewhere. And all the days for the iteration are listed. And you put in what you start with six ideal hours in every slot. And if you're not present, you, know, you block it out for whatever reason. This was a holiday, so one, two. Yeah, that was New Year's. Um, and day one of an iteration is planning the iteration. And we spend half a day doing that. So we immediately deduct three hours from our productive time because it's wasteful to plan. You can't actually work on anything. You're still figuring it out. If you were lean, you wouldn't be adding that up. You'd kind of be doing it on the fly. So we, we consider that waste. Team lead, let's see, who was the team lead? Anthony was the team lead. You'll notice he only took four hours in a day. And on Thursday, maybe there was some meeting planned. And then on Friday of the last day of the iteration, everybody deducted like crazy because you got your review, you got your retrospective, you got your bullshit time to kind of settle everything. You're not really as productive and they kind of know it. So we total that up. This does the math. It figures out how many productive days you have because there's a holiday here, nine out of 10 days. And then that translates down into here. So 330 translates down into this part of the, the bottom part of the spreadsheet, sorry, over here. And then you start to mark your stories in JIRA. So for every story you plan, you write down the story and you also write down the number of hours that each person predicts they might work on that story. So they're tasking it out, so to speak. And in doing so, it doesn't have to be accurate. It just has to consume the hours in some way. It doesn't really matter who takes the work, right? We're not volunteering for the work in advance. We're kind of saying, well, let's take the leap of faith that Sakshi and Alexi knew this the best and they said it'd probably take three hours for this task and nine hours for that task. And so it starts to deduct from that 330 and compute a balance. When that balance reaches 10% of the total, we tell the team, stop tasking workout. You're too close. You're going to be off by something anyway. So not only do you have a fudge factor for story points, you have a fudge factor for your ideal um, for your estimate, your estimates of tasks by the hour. And from that, we calculate the ideal hours, which in this case is 4.6. That number can be com 
can be directly transcribed into the other metric. No guesswork here. These are planned productive hours. And some teams, they do it a little differently. They'll, they'll actually write in the waste. They'll say meetings and they'll put in the number of hours everybody has to attend the meetings. I prefer to see it removed from your capacity and, and just account for it that way. So this is very useful. Every team uses it at OpenLink and they love it. Um, so the reduced technical debt, the build the right product, and then this notion of health. So now we move away from the metrics, which are the numbers, and we move to the metrics, which are qualitative, which you can't really put a number on. You get in a room once in a while with the team lead, with the product owner, with the manager, and you start to have these discussions about, well, do you have pride in the quality of your work? Yes or no? And, you know, this takes some soul searching. Well, we're, we're a temporary team. We don't even own this thing. Not really. We really don't give a shit. We just try to get it out as fast as we can. You know, if we were sticking around, maybe we'd have higher pride in the quality of our work. Dependability. That's about meeting commitments. Are we tracking to the release plan? Yes or no? No. Yes. Well, that's not good enough. Tell me why. And it, it prompts you to ask some questions. And any Agilist will say, will tell you that if you have a metric that's sort of off kilter, you want to go talk to the team. You want to figure out what is going on. It's not just a number. There's a rationale behind it. Productivity, Agile principles. So this goes to governance, right? Are we, are we really looking in on the team roles? Are they effective in their roles? And team culture. So what's funny is this top one, team morale is high. I haven't, I've been conducting team health meetings for years. The very first words out of everyone's mouth is, well, the team morale is pretty high. And it's almost like going to the psychiatrist and saying, I'm fine, you know? And it's not until maybe the last five minutes of the psychiatry session where you actually get your problem out. Um, yeah, morale is high when we're not fighting with each other. <laughs> oh, thanks for telling me that you're having a problem. Um, what's funny is it's usually a problem about um, improving communication or some people don't really care or uh, there's silos still. They're not doing cross-functional behavior. There's still, there's still these silos of, of experts that don't want to share their information, their knowledge. Uh, we have what we lovingly call heroes that refuse to be cross-functional because they think it's job security. If they're the hero, they always save the team's life. Um, I think the important part here is that the metrics help you make decisions about how teams are improving and growing, but there's nothing better than a health meeting to talk to teams and really get to the root of the, of the problems. So that's about it. Um, quite a deep dive. I don't know how long I spent, maybe an hour. Yeah, just about. Um, it's, it's a lot here, right? It's a lot. And um, don't underestimate the power and the flaws behind metrics. You got to measure the right thing. And don't just measure it for measuring's sake. So any questions, any, any comments? Hi. 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 Yeah. So I, I, I noticed that your methodology or your process, metrics process, is like similar to CMMI. Uh, the cap I don't know if you've heard about it, uh, capability maturity level integration. Uh, the only difference is that um, there's like a goal that's established at the start of a project instead of like zero. And then, uh, and it's because of the fact that it recognizes that there are certain things that are beyond their control and so those are like outliers? Well, it depends what you mean, right? So if you're going to measure things that are out of their control, what are you really measuring? <laughs> are you measuring your ability to just measure something out of their control? You have to, in a way, think about this as what are you trying to achieve? What is your expectation? If you want to achieve better quality, maybe the thing you should be measuring is not in the company, but something out of, outside the company, like... How many escalated issues do I get reported by customers? 
And that might be very hard to um, assimilate to the actual, you know, cause and effect. Just because I have lower escalations coming from customers might not mean the quality is high. It just might mean that they're not using the features that have the bugs. I right, see. So have to be careful um, what you attribute the the reasoning behind the metric. So you got to be really careful to, to when when you measure things. You want to measure things that teams do have control over, because that's going to show their improvement. Yeah. So exactly. That's why then during the the equivalent of the retrospective in CMI is called the root cause analysis. At that point, you actually determine why were you not able to reach your goal, for example, of let's say zero defects. Okay. And then, yeah, okay, that I mean, makes sense. I mean, look, okay. as long as you set a goal, now I said, I don't know how many times, zero tolerance, right? You want, you, you want your goal to be zero for, for defects that escape the iteration. Yeah. But the reason there's a goal is because it's hard to achieve and it's hard to maintain yeah. and sustain that. Um, but if you don't set a goal, you can't possibly achieve it. So you've got to have some notion of what you're working toward. And then you have to start identifying, why can't I get there? And it might be yeah. for no cause of your own. What if I tell you that the testing framework is flawed and it doesn't allow me to test for certain things that I really need to test for? Exactly. So then you need to improve your process. Not just my process. It might be the whole organization's process. process. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, give yeah, me yeah, the right yeah. environment to test what I need to test every night. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the team's process or the organization's process. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, uh, just, just one. So my question is, um, is there a way by which we can incorporate cost performance in in the metrics system that you have in the same way that you have EVM? Okay, I'll tell you. I, I've had many many arguments about measuring cost of projects. Okay, here's what I know. Um, I have a bag of money at the beginning of my project. Yeah. I put it down on the table. If I make that known to the team and I explain to them, do not spend more money that's in that than, than that's in that bag, uh -huh. then you can start to measure the cost of things. But if you don't tell them how much money is in that bag and you just say, just do this under cost and they, and nobody knows how much that is under budget. Nobody knows how much that is. It's extremely unfair because they don't know how to gauge themselves. For instance, if I know that every iteration costs me $50,000, let's just say it that way. I've got a team that when they operate at normal rate, they burn 50 grand, okay? Yeah. And salaries and bonus and whatever, and health costs, whatever that is. And that's a small number, by the way. It could be close to 100 grand. So let's say they burn 50 grand, and I'm given a million dollars at the beginning of my project, and I estimate that project to be um, I don't know, 15 iterations. Yeah. I'm going to expect to burn money at a constant yeah. rate, almost at the same rate I'm burning story points throughout yeah. those iterations. Yeah. Now, if I, if I keep taking stock, if I keep measuring how much of the work is remaining, forget about what I burned in the past, yeah. that scope is going to change. We know it. We know it's going to change. Yeah. It's not going to stay steady. And let's say we measure what's remaining. There's a ratio of what was spent versus what's remaining extrapolated yeah. out in dollars. And yeah. if I burn more money than I have remaining, I'm in trouble. If I'm burning it at the wrong rate, I'm in trouble. So yeah. I can actually turn a project red, yellow, or green with a traffic light to say, I'm on budget, I'm under budget, I'm over budget. And it's only based on what's remaining, my guess of what's remaining and yeah. what I've currently spent. And that's it. And I, you know, and if somebody wants an exact from that, like a CEO always wants to know, Yes, I yeah. want to know why a team can never stay on budget. Why do they always spend more money than I give them? And the answer is because things are always harder than they expect them to be. It's that simple. It's a simple answer. They don't like that answer. No, no, they're not estimating correctly. Yeah, you're right. They're never going to estimate correctly. You're absolutely correct. Why can't you get that through your thick skull? that people are not capable of estimating the future with a crystal ball. They guess. Oh, um, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the scenario where you're working for a software development company and you have a client who is giving like you... Like me. Go ahead. Yeah, like you. Yeah. Like me. So, and so in every... like So in the company, every week, you, you discuss, okay, 
uh, we think we won't be able to finish this as no. planned. See, see, in a way, um, we are always sort of airdropped into the middle of a conversation with many assumptions. Here's what yeah. I, I'm reading into what you just said. There's an assumption that you had a fixed price, fixed scope project. Is that the yeah. case? Yeah. yeah. So right away, that doesn't work, right? We know that fixed price, fixed scope projects don't work because they never fix the scope. They fix the price, but they never fix the scope. They always want the scope to move around. And because That's they fine. do yeah. that, they always do, always, always. Yeah. If I tell a customer, you cannot change the scope, and I'm having a meeting, and I discuss that with them, and they say, no, no, you're not right. We'll never fix, we'll never change the scope. By the end of the conversation, they've already changed the scope in some way. But the yeah. amount of money never moved. So with that said, here's the way we should be approaching things like that. We should be able to say, I see what you want built. I would like you, I would like to have a workshop with you where you rank the highest ranked items, the most important things that you must have. And I can then make a prediction as to how much of those things I can finish off with the amount of money you've given me. Now, if it turns out that there are more things that you need, then we have to talk about maybe swapping out something that you thought you needed that you really don't need right? Rank them differently. You notice I'm not using prioritize. I'm using rank because that forces me to make a choice to throw something away, right? Everything could be high priority until you run out of money. Then it's not high priority anymore. Somehow you live without it. So I always equate that to building a house. I build a house. I build the most important features into the house right away because I have to get the certificate of occupancy to live there. And so I'm willing to spend $200,000 to build that base house how much more money I have left over is going to dictate what kind of goodies I put inside of it, what kind of tile I pick and what kind of flooring I pick and what kind of fixtures I pick and do I furnish every room or some of the rooms. But I have to decide what is the most important thing for me to have my minimal business increment, my sufficient functionality. What do I need to live? And if that thing is open-ended, I'm going to spend an open-ended amount of money. But if that thing is fixed, I still only have a fixed amount of money to spend. I'm only going to buy the most important things. And if I don't happen to get, you know, the shower curtain that I loved, I get the least, the less expensive one. Maybe that's okay. The same thing has to be gone through with a customer. You have to have a workshop with a customer to actually describe the process by which you build software. And that is not an exact science. And they can't have everything if they have a fixed budget. They can have things that fit into that fixed budget. And every minute we spend after that, you're going to spend more money. I guess if the CEO is concerned about, for example, if the reason why you're not able to produce uh, the, the product at the time that you promised is because there are the defects, like a uh, team... That's not a good assumption. That's not a good assumption. Yeah. There, you, you can't make assumptions like that. What if I tell you that every project I've ever worked on, the scope has changed drastically? Not a little bit, a lot. So much so that it, sometimes it extends the projects three or four months. It's not because we invented bugs. It's because they changed their mind. And they should be changing their mind. They're changing their mind because they really know now what they want and they didn't really know before what they wanted. Like bugs, in other words, for example, if you discover there are bugs, and the time that the developer will, will spend for that, Will you charge the customer? Is it acceptable that the, the, the customer will be charged for it? Or how's should about it I just how's about I just charge you for the outcome, regardless of how I get there? Okay. I mean, I'm just asking you, are you okay with that? I don't even tell you there are bugs. I just uh, charge what? you for the outcome. When you no, buy I QuickBooks, guess, when you I buy TurboTax, do you know how many bugs were in there before you got it? Uh -huh. If you buy TurboTax off the shelf. Do you know how many bugs were in there before you purchased it? No. Do you care? Oh, uh, if I discover it later, I would. I no, guess. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about bugs that were discovered and fixed. Were uh, you charged, were you no, charged no. for that? Were you charged for those bugs? Uh, I see. Okay. No, I'm asking you. Do you think you've been charged for those bugs? Yeah, I guess. Of course. It was built into the price. That's the cost of doing business. Okay. Right? So if I know that I've got a very complex project where I've got to add um, a certain amount of overhead 
to my I project see. plan for testing, for automation, for uh, let's just for no better use of, of the term, I, I, you know, to not allow bugs to escape, then I have to build that in. I have to charge the customer for okay. slower development time for the increased quality. You have to admit that it takes time to build quality in, right? Yeah. Okay, so you're gonna pay for that. That all translates into iterations and go ahead and use an approximation of 50 grand an iteration and you will end up with, instead of it taking you 10 iterations, it'll take you 12 iterations or 13 yeah. iterations. And that's why some people play, uh, pay by feature, for example, right? As opposed to a fixed price on a fixed scope. Or a uh, set of features, right? They'll, yeah. they'll pay yeah. for a collection of features that is the minimal thing that they need to do business with. Yeah, but they pay by feature and you get them kind of involved in that, as David said, it's gonna be a set of features. But the bottom line, the thing that makes Agile work with software development is never releasing an entire completed product. It's about releasing uh, some value immediately that someone can use and then yeah. on that. If yeah. you go in with the you know, typical Moscow, you know, must have what it, with, the, with the typical traditional project team, they're going to try to, you know, go through and prioritize everything they can possibly get with the money, money, money that they have and the amount of time that they've got with that consultant. Yeah. What I have found yeah. is that companies want fixed price projects because they know it locks in the budget and it won't float all over the place. And companies like me, they hate them because they're never, they always eat something. They always eat the difference. Yeah. And um, once you have a project that's underway and you're almost there and the customer says, oh no, I forgot this little thing. Can you throw it in? The likelihood of that happening is really good because you're trying to form the relationship and keep a customer yeah. happy. So you're going to eat the difference. Yeah. Now, a, a well-formed contract will include a base price for the base model, for delivery number one, and everything you think of after the fact that you know we weren't able to tolerate the move in scope will be time and material. And most companies okay. are okay with that. Yeah, yeah. And you can still have a budget. The, the bottom line is, you know, uh, what what most companies are afraid of is uh, not getting anything and spending the whole budget. Um, a lot of yeah. times, you know, the opposite. What happens? They get something, but it's rushed to the point where everyone has to sign off on it to yeah. accept it. And then they're never happy and they've run out of money. So yeah, yeah that's where you, you know, what Dave's talking about. The measuring, measuring parts are really good. And if you can measure early on, that allows you to, to estimate better as you roll out every feature. And, right. So uh, if you have dependable teams that always make good on their commitments and they know that they have a certain burn rate and they can get a project done, pretty reliably i'm very cautious to say definitely right but if they're yeah. if they're fairly confident in their estimates and maybe you factor in an extra iteration for i don't know what's going to happen you can actually make money with a team that's very dependable you can actually make some very good financial decisions yeah but, Super important. so that's the thing about discipline agile right the discipline part of the discipline is we have to measure it's goal oriented the whole thing about da so if we don't have goals that we have at least thought of enough to measure and that's why dave's gqm is great i use gqm all the time now i'm not uh, i'm getting better at it and i liked how dave you um you add an extra column in there to quantify it as well that's brilliant so um yeah if you go back to that I, yeah I so like, all of these kind of say here's how you derive it derive it that's what i was getting at yeah you're deriving yeah. it which is brilliant because it's another step but it makes you think a little bit because technical debt's big I mean, it's a, it, it's, so you honed it down to, okay, what to us means we've reduced technical debt. And obviously that translated into time and probably, you know, waste and for pain in the future. Cause you're paying for that all the time, every time you got a legacy issue. So therefore it translates to money. Um, so that's good. Yeah. I, I would say that to answer your question um, really completely, we do have a measure of cost versus oh. an initial estimate. So oh. what we do is coming out of inception, if a team believes that a project is a certain size, they'll do the calculation, they'll, they'll do the math under the covers to say, this is what we think it will cost open link. And they'll, they'll multiply the, you know, the number of product owners, number of team, you know, people have different costs within the organization. 
and yeah. they'll do the math and that's fine. I don't want to know what the math is. I could care less. I'm going to do the best I can no matter what. And then they come back later and they do a postmortem. When the project delivers, they'll look at how much money you actually spent through the, through the timesheet system. What yeah. was actually billed to the project. And if those things reconcile and they're within a certain percentage and they'll just say, okay, it was pretty accurate. And if not, then they figure out, well, we're off by this amount all the time. And you know what? It's a fair measurement, but I don't think the team really cares. The team works the best they can, regardless of that number. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thanks. Good, good. Um, so any other questions for Dave or in general too? Um, yeah, I beat this up quite a bit, huh? Well, thanks for listening, everybody. Um, I ran later than I thought, but you know what? I covered a lot of detail and I'm glad I did. Um, yeah. I gave you the most for your money. Yeah, absolutely. Um